for a few weeks now. And I want to turn your attention to John, the 12th chapter, starting at the first verse. It says, Then Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Then they made him supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye will have with you, but me ye have not always. With the help of the Lord tonight, I want to talk to you for a few moments on take the anointing with you. On take the anointing with you. When you look at the relationship between Jesus, Lazarus, Mary, uh, Martha, and Mary, it's safe to say that, well, they were friends. And <coughs> Jesus even said that when he went to the grave of Mary that he loved him. You see, when you look back at Luke, the 10th chapter, that Jesus had came to their home, and Mary sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to what he had to say. Martha even got a little bent, got a little out of, out of shape because she was working in the kitchen and doing whatever she had to make sure was done. And Mary wasn't helping her. He went, she went out and she told Jesus, said, hey, says, you know, why don't you tell her to get in here and help me in the kitchen? Jesus answered, said, Martha, you're, you're, you're worried about all the preparations of this gathering, but Mary has chosen the good things, the one thing that she needs for her soul. And as I sit and I, I started studying, I was looking at that, the story stops there. And that, that meeting, the story just stops there. there there's no, there's, there's no uh, 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 action that was talked about that was taken after that uh, by Mary or anyone else. The story just stops. Just that she sat at the feet of Jesus. What a place to be. Yeah. At the feet of Jesus. When you think about that, I go, wow, just to think about sitting at the feet of Jesus, what else could you ask for? I want you to think about that. What else could you ask for than to sit at the feet of Jesus? Many times we come to church and we sit in the worship service and we sit through the prayer service and we listen to the Word and we receive a warm, comforting feeling. We go home knowing that the Word hopefully has found a place to lodge in our heart, our soul, and our mind. When I started, I started praying a while back whenever someone was speaking that God would open my heart and my mind and my soul, that all three places will be open for the Word of God. So hopefully when you leave, you leave with some Word that has found a lodging place. Of course, then we see in John, the 11th chapter, that Lazarus had become very sick. It sent word to Jesus, and you know that there was a delay, and when Jesus had got there, he didn't even get to the house when they were told that Jesus was on his way, and Martha ran out to meet him, and then Mary went out to meet him. And Mary, when Mary met with them, 
she fell at his feet. And she said, if you would have only been here, my brother would not be dead. Well, Jesus ended up saying, okay, where is he at? Where's he at? Take me to where he's at. They take him to the grave. They roll back the stone. Martha says, wait a minute. It's been four days. He's stinking by now. Mary sitting there watching. Jesus called out for Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? Lazarus came forth. Jumping, all tied up. He said, loose him and let him go. Loose him. And let him go. When you sit and you think about that for a moment, Mary sit at his feet once more. But this time, she not only heard the words from God, but she saw some action that went along with it. But she also witnessed the results of the actions when God spoke. When God spoke, there was results. When we hear the Word of God, and then we see it in action, and, it re and its results comes forth, it will build faith that should move us to action. But sometimes it doesn't. I know that I have sat in services where the power of God was so strong, and I just sit there. I was at such awe of the presence of God that I was not moved to action. Whose fault was that? It was my fault. It was my fault for not stepping up and stepping in to the presence of the Almighty God. For not taking that step out of that little safe zone that I had built for myself into the anointing and the presence of God Almighty. My fault. Sometimes we find ourselves, sometimes at all, that we think, well, God would never use me for anything like that. You know, I'm just somebody that comes and sits and listens to the Word of God, and God moves upon me. I'm a good person, and I just come and sit and worship God. But I'm sorry to tell you, you're not. Your, your presence and being in the presence of God should move us all to action. In our text, we see that Jesus went <laughs> and met with Lazarus and the others, and they had made him supper. Martha once again served. Now, let me get something to you. There's nothing wrong with, with Martha. There was nothing really wrong with Martha. She was a servant. She served. But Mary desired something more. She just desired something more. There's nothing wrong with service. But understand, sometimes you need to take yourself out of that mode. Don't be so busy in your work for the Lord that you forget to communicate with the Lord, that you forget to, to seek His company, that you forget to know that there's something more than this working for the Lord. There's finding that place and staying near and dear to God. So Martha was serving, and Lazarus was seated at the table with Jesus. The Bible says, and Mary took a pound of spikenard oil, or ointment. This pound of ointment or oil was worth 300 pence. That's an equivalent to the tens of thousands of dollars today. I read that on the internet. I can't really tell you that it's true, but it sure sounded pretty good. Now, know up to this point, that Mary had heard the word. She had sit at Jesus' feet and she had heard the word. She had fell at Jesus' feet and she heard his words and seen the actions of his words and seen the result and her brother's alive. She's seen that. But this time, this time was different. This time was totally different than the other two times that she had come into the presence of God and sit at His feet. This time she took the ointment, she broke the seal, and she anointed the feet 
of Jesus. She was moved to action because of her love and devotion for him. She anointed the feet of Jesus. But the Bible goes on to say, in our text, she took her hair and she wiped the remaining ointment, dried his feet with her hair. The Bible says that this ointment filled the entire house. You could, no place in their house could you find a place where you could not smell the ointment that was anointed of Jesus' feet. Now understand that Judas jumped into this one. Hey, what you doing? This could have been sold, man, for 300 pence and it could have gone into bag and we could have... He carried the bag for the disciples. Put in the bag and we could have been given some food to the poor. Bible says it wasn't because he really cared about the poor. He liked the weight of that bag. He was a thief. Bible said it. Don't no, 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 the Bible said it, not me. So it wasn't particularly because of all that. It's because he was worried about the money. But Jesus said, No, wait a minute. You leave her alone. <coughs> this has been done in preparation of my burial. I want you to understand something. Anytime that you try to do something for God, there's always going to be somebody somewhere that's going to say something. And it's usually not going to be good. Well, I think they're just wasting their time. God ain't going to use them. So I called me once and said, talk to me about church and stuff, and said, uh, well, you know, guys our age, we're not going to be used no more. I said, what? What are you talking about? Ah, uh, guys our age, we're done. I said, wait a minute, what you don't seem to understand as long as there's breath in my body. I'm going to find something that I can do for the Lord. I don't care whether it's sweeping a floor, dusting something, or teaching a Sunday school lesson, or maybe get a chance to preach. I'm going to do something for God as long as there is air in my lungs. <coughs> so understand, it doesn't matter what someone else says about you or about what you try to do. It only matters that you step out for God, that you step into some type of anointing that's flowing out of the heavens, and you get a hold of something that God has for you, and that you do it with all of your might. I don't care if you're 8 or 80, 85. You could do it. You can do it. Because God's not done with you yet. If you're breathing, you still got a chance to touch somebody's heart, to move upon somebody in the name of the Lord. Understand, up to this point, the only person that had said anything to Mary was Martha, and that's just because she didn't want to work in the kitchen by herself. What a sad, wasn't it? So now, all of a sudden, Judas is going to jump on the bandwagon and jump on her, one of the disciples. Well, Jesus put the quietus on that. That means he put the stop to that. I want you to understand that the root word of anoint means an unction or an act. An unction or an act. Understand that when she anointed Jesus' feet, she was taking action. And the Bible says that the house was filled with the smell of the ointment. The smell of this ointment, well, it'd be around a while. It wasn't, it wasn't anything cheap. It was very expensive. They made that stuff. You know, if you go buy, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you what it is. I don't know. SD Lauder or something. I don't know. Debbie used to buy that SD Lauder. Beautiful. I knocked one over and broke it open. Good Lord, have mercy. Lord, that house smelled like beautiful all over the place. She come home and says, what did you do? I said, I broke your bottle of beautiful. She goes, that's expensive. I said, well, I'm sorry. So it was all over the house. So this, this, the smell of the ointment 
was everywhere. Just think that after everybody had left, as they were getting ready for bed, they could still smell. They could still smell the anointing. As Mary laid her head down on the pillow, she could still smell the anointing. I'm going someplace with this. When she woke up, she could still smell the anointing. When she went out to the marketplace, all the people around her could smell the anointing that was on her. As she walked down the streets, the smell of the anointing was still upon her. Every place that she went, the smell of the anointing was upon her. Understand this, that whenever there is anointing, there is action. Whenever there's anointing, there is action. There's never an anointing without some type of action. All throughout the Bible, whenever there was an anointing, there was a king or a priest, someone healed. There was something that happened right after the anointing that made the anointing worth it. So the anointing comes only with an action. The devil, he don't care if you come to church. He really don't. He don't care if you sing a song or clap your hands a little bit, give a queen praise. He don't care. But what he worries, he starts to worry whenever something starts burning with inside you. All of a sudden, your worship starts to take on a little bit more meaning. All of a sudden, your prayer starts coming from deep within you. Then he starts worrying. But he really gets worried when you start to find your anointing. When you start to find the anointing that God has for you, the devil starts really getting worried. Then he knows that he's going to have to find some place to go because he's not a welcome wherever the anointing is. Glory to God. So understand that we have been talking about evangelism as our theme for this month. We need to find you, I, we need to find our anointing. Because it's imperative that in this time of evangelism that we know our anointing. We need to live in the anointed presence of the one true God. If we want to be effective in working for the Lord, We've got to find our anointing. I don't know about you, but I want to go home tonight. I want to smell the anointing. When I lay my head down on the pillow, I want to smell the anointing. I sit there thinking, when was the last time that I was woke up in the middle of the night to someone speaking in tongues and realized it was me? I want that again. I want that again. I want God to wake me up in the middle of the night Speaking in other tongues with somebody on my mind that I can hit the floor and pray that God would move upon them. I want God to give me a burden for those that are lost. I want to fall asleep with the anointing. I want to wake up in the morning and the first thing I think about is not the Debbie's breast mouth bed. I know somebody's going to tell on me, aren't you? I bet you all can't wait. As soon as we say amen, you're all going to run over and tell her. But I don't, I don't want that. What I want when I wake up in the morning is I want to smell and feel the anointing of God that I had when I went to sleep. I want to wake up before my feet hit the floor and know I've got the anointing of God upon my life. I do not want to take one step out of my bed and not know that God is there with me. I want the anointing when I go to work. I want the anointing when I go about my daily deeds. I want the anointing. Young people, throats kill me. When you go to work, when you go to school, I want you to take the anointing with you. I want you to take it with you. I don't want you to even think about walking out the door in the morning without asking God, let the anointing go with me. God, let the anointing 
accompany me today. Don't let me walk out the door without the anointing with me. I want to live in the anointing. I want to take it where I go. Hallelujah. If we are going to evangelize our world, we need the anointing of Jesus Christ in our lives. <coughs> we need it today, and we need the anointing every day from now until the day that he comes. We need the anointing. I want to make heaven my home. I don't understand these people. I say, well, I hope I make it. You what? I had a guy at work when I was working tell me, well, I'm going to hell, but I'm going to have a big party. I said, you think so, huh? You think so? Well, I'm going to tell you what. I don't want to go no place where I'm going to be burning all the time. It don't sound like no kind of party to me. I want to make sure that my calling and my election is sure. This idea that you don't know till you die is a little late then to try to be figuring it out. I want to know because I want my life to be in the anointing of God. We need to live in the anointing of God. This church needs to live in the anointing of God like we have never lived before. Because God has called us to do something for Him. We're not supposed to go to heaven by ourselves. We're supposed to take somebody with us. I'm going to tell you what, every time I see this guy up here, I don't know if you pay attention to him, he plays that bass, and I can tell when he starts, Lord, start, he starts doing one of these, and he'll pick that leg. Oh, uh, man, it just tears me up. Man, I want to cut a rug every time I see the anointing fall upon him. I want to see the anointing fall upon this church like it has never fallen before. We need to reach out to our families We need that are lost. We need to reach out to our friends that are lost. Somebody said to me once, says, well, they, they think we're nuts. I said, well, if they think you're nuts, who cares? Go ahead and ask them. If they think that, who cares? If they think, well, okay, let me prove it to you. I'll show you how nuts I am. Try to tell somebody, once, why don't you just come to church? I said, I'll tell you what, you come to church. And I mentioned this in Sunday school class. You come to church. And you don't, and when you leave, if you can honestly tell me that you didn't feel a thing, I will never ask you again. Because, see, I know the Bible church. And I know that when we gather together, we're going to touch the throne of God. So I can say that freely with them. I say, you know, you ought to come. Well, you know, I don't know. I says, I do. You need to come to church. We need to reach out like we have never reached out before. You know these cards? These cards we have? How many of you, you have done any of them? I sit at the Dodge dealership Monday, I think, Monday morning. Had my oil changed on Debbie. Had the oil, Debbie's oil changed. I took my Bible in there, and I'm sitting, I'm sitting next to the Dodge Challenger with that big monster engine in it that everybody goes by and sees. I'm reading these sets of scriptures for tonight. And this guy walked by me twice. And I kind of looked up at him. And he was kind of going like this. So when he walked by, I kind of shook my head. And he looked away and kept walking. I thought, man, if you just, if you, if you just acknowledge, I'd sit you down. I'd invite you to sit with me. And I'd share with you what God gave me. Man, do something. I seen somebody, somebody here. This is evangelism. Sister son. Pay for somebody's laundry. She read her Bible at work, school, or a public place. Man, grab these cards. Do something for the Lord. Drop. Now, I'm going to tell you what. If you're going to pay, if you're going to leave your tip and leave a church card, leave a good tip. Don't be one that's in your tipping, okay, if you're going to leave a church card. You know, you need to be multi, multi-tipper. 20% at least, all right? But reach out to somebody. Take the time. Work in, their, work in your spot that you're comfortable in. And the better you get to working at it, you know what? It won't be too much longer. You might be teaching a Bible study. <laughs> God wants to use us all, but He wants us to live in His anointing. Because when we live in the anointing, God reveals things to us that we would not normally see. 
with just these human eyes. God will open things up, open doors, so that we can reach out and touch someone's life for the better. Wouldn't it be wonderful when you went to heaven, you took about 15 or 20 people with you, and they took 15 or 20 people with you? Wow. Wow. We, you know what? If we would just reach out to people, we'd have to, I don't know what we'd have. We'd have to have two services on Sunday. Have a monster Sunday school in the middle just so that we can accompany, can accompany everyone. Y'all are awful quiet. Do what, huh? Have to go to two days? Well, I'd take that. Saturday and Sunday. We could have the legal, we could have the legal people on Saturday and we have the spiritual. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wouldn't it be terrible if we had to do something like that? Don't you think God wants us? God doesn't want us to be a little bitty church. God don't want any church to be a little bitty church. He called us to be mega churches because as long as there's someone out there that isn't saved, it's our responsibility to see that the Word of God gets to them. And you know how you do that? Living in the anointing. Living in the anointing. Taking it home with you. You've got an unsaved spouse, you just got to live in the anointing. you got to live in the anointing and hope and pray that God will move. If He doesn't, well, I don't know what to tell you. But live in the anointing. Live in the anointing. You've got unsaved friends and loved ones live in the anointing. Live it in front of them. Show them God's love. Show them that there's something better than just sitting at home on Sunday watching the boob tube or one-eyed devil or whatever you want to call it. You know what? I don't miss football at all, Brother Carter. I don't miss it at all. I don't miss it at all. Because I've got something better to replace it. Something better to replace it. When you live in the anointing, there's not a whole else, lot of, there's not a lot else that matters but, but living in the anointing and letting God touch and move upon your life. We all have unsaved loved ones. We all have folks that we, that we love that we don't want to see lost. I'm going to tell you, live in the anointing. Take them upon your heart and do all that you can to see them saved out of this lost and destructive world. The news is full of nothing but bad news. And what kills me if they can't find any good bad news here to report, they go find bad news in California to report. I said they're listening to the news and they're talking about a triple shooting. I'm going, whoa, where's that in that? California. I said, well, I guess we had a slow news day in Indianapolis yesterday. They're talking about something happening in California. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is alive and well. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. And He's got the anointing for us to send out and to see others saved. I charge you today to find your anointing. Take it out of here. The anointing will do you no good if you leave it at church. The anointing only does you good if you take it with you. You take it home. Take it to your unsaved family members. Take it to your unsaved friends on the job. Take it with you to this dying world. Somebody's waiting for you to give them a word of salvation. Somebody's waiting for you to toss the lifeline to them so that they can realize that there is something that can save their soul. That there's a God that does love them. Love to this generation is really unknown. They really don't know what it is. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of young people don't even know what a father's love is. They're talking to them about your heavenly father love you. They have no thing to equate to that. But what you can do is share your experience of God's love with them. The world is waiting for you to evangelize it. You know people that I don't know. I know people you don't know. And it's time that we reached out with the love of Christ and talked to them and shared what God has. Folks, I'm done.